Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Welcome back, everybody. We've got an awesome show today. Our guest is Steve Eisman. Steve is most famous, of course, for his bet against the housing market back way back when, 2007, 2008, in his role in Michael Lewis's book, The Big Short. He's now a portfolio manager at Newberger Berman, is joining us today to talk about everything going on in the market. Steve, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. We've scheduled to have you on twice, and both times the market has dumped. You know, two times, maybe not a trend. Let's get this interview over so the market can go back up, please. Seriously. Back earlier in the year, you were chatting a little bit about paradigm shifts and what's going on with markets. Here we are in the summer, Olympics starting. How are you feeling? What's going on, markets? I'm pretty sanguine. What I would say, um, if you want to paint one of the negative data points, you know, the consumer seems to be slowing somewhat. Spending, if you look at Visa or the American Express data that came out, volumes are slowing. Credit quality and the consumer delinquencies have started to tick up. But it's not anything alarming. I don't think the consumer is overlevered. The consumer is still employed. Income is still going up. So look, on the margin, things are slowing. Maybe we're going to head into more of a slowdown. But I think the general health of the U.S. economy is pretty good. And I'm not particularly worried. All right. So within that, everyone loves to talk about Powell, what's going on, interest rates kind of chilling out up here. We got any sort of view on the rest of the year? I think the Fed is not all that relevant anymore. When the Fed raises rates 500 basis points, that's a repricing of money and a repricing of risk. When people are talking about the Fed cutting one or two times, that's interesting from an intellectual perspective. And people who get paid to comment on the Fed have something to talk about. But I don't think it really means all that much to the economy. People on Fed Day like to treat Powell as if he's like Moses coming down with the tablets. And they check the tablets to make sure the Ten Commandments are in the right order still. I find that kind of amusing. But like I said, I don't think the Fed right now is a mover and shaper of markets. I really don't. I mean, that's because you and I can think back to the time when there was Greenspan. I mean, Powell, compared to old Alan, there's a quote we can, we saw the other day I'd never seen before where he said, this is Alan, not Powell. Since I've become a central banker, I've learned to mumble with great incoherence. If I seem unduly clear to you, you must have understood what I said, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was great. All right. I wouldn't have pegged you as an AI guy, but that's one of your big themes now. Yep. I'm all Apple ecosystem. They got a new phone coming out. What's the big story with AI? Are you an early adopter? I'm not an early adopter on anything. I'm a late adopter. I'm old. I'm over 60. If you've adopted at this point, then maybe we're we're at that point in the cycle where we're waiting for the broad adoption. No, I don't think we're even close to that part of the cycle. One of the interesting things from the last couple of months was listening to the Accenture earnings conference call, which was probably about, a, it's like a month already. I mean, God, things have moved so quickly. Accenture has the consulting business and the outsourcing business. And what's actually interesting is that the consulting business is not doing particularly well, but the outsourcing business is doing very well. One of the major reasons why the outsourcing business is doing well is that corporate America is not ready for AI. And what I mean by they're not ready for AI Most of these companies don't even have the data in one place and cleaned up enough so that they actually can begin the analysis of what to do. So they've all hired Accenture basically to clean up their data. So we're still in such early stages of this whole AI story of most of the companies are still cleaning up their data before they figure out what they're going to do with it. Where does that translate as investable? You know, Goldman's got a recent report, and we'll throw all these resources in the show notes, listeners, talking about Gen AI maybe a little overhyped. Some of the stocks have obviously done exceptional. Apple has this new phone coming out that supposedly is going to have some AI features and all the Apple fanboys are really hot and bothered on this one. The ones that like to buy the phones and flip them. This one more than any seems like they're getting excited about. How do you think about this from an investment standpoint? I kind of on a bunch of different levels, you know, I think 
First of all, I think there's an argument to be made that hardware will continue to outperform software for a very long time. It's not my thesis. I wish it was. It's a very good thesis. But the idea is that for a long time, software always outperformed hardware. One of the reasons why it outperformed hardware is because the entire software industry moved to a SaaS model. And this is where I like to say never underestimate the impact of the Excel spreadsheet on people's psyches. And what I mean by that is before the SaaS model, software companies just sold software. So if you were modeling a software company, all you would do is take the prior year's software revenue and you multiply it by 1.06, something like that. Your model is incredibly inelegant, very inaccurate, very volatile. By moving to a SaaS model, you have a much more elegant model because what you're modeling is average number of customers going forward multiplied by the average selling price. So it makes the ability to project forward a lot easier. And that's one of the reasons why software companies saw their multiples explode. Now, I think what could happen over the next 10 years is that you still need hardware. You could argue about what the hardware growth is going to be, but you're still going to need it. But the cost to develop software is probably going to collapse because of AI. And if that's the case, then some of the moats some of these software companies have around their businesses are not going to be quite as strong. So that's one vector that I'm thinking about. The other vector is just that for large corporations, whatever they do in AI is going to be done in the cloud. So it's a massive computer massaging, data massaging story. And the companies that are going to benefit will be the ones we all know that have massive databases of people. And then the other thing is that one day there will be apps. I have no idea what those apps are going to be. People want to use them on their phone. And if they're going to want to use them on their phone, everybody's going to have to upgrade their phone. Now, I have a phone and an iPad, and I tend to use my iPad a lot more than my phone. I'll probably buy both. You can get a massive upgrade cycle. It's going to be pretty incredible. It's interesting because, you know, you, you see so many of these just giant trends and was chatting with my wife about... Somebody married you. But for the majority, <laughs> hey, this hasn't... This hasn't been published yet. So in between when we record and publish, something could happen. But we were talking, I got a seven-year-old and I said, you know, there's a big push for the majority of my life on teaching kids how to code. And I get how it makes you think and the science and logic of it. But I said, look, by the time he's high school, college, will coding even be a thing the way that it is today with AI? It may be more of like editing. You sell AI to you know, create coder for X and then you have to check it and edit it or fix it up. As a student of history and as we think about markets and cycles, when you think of a new technology, a new science everyone's hot and bothered about, are there any sort of lessons from the past? I don't find what's happened in the past here all that relevant. I mean, people will, will talk about the internet bubble in the late 90s, early 2000s. It's funny, when I was at Oppenheimer in the 90s, the guy who sat in the office across the hall from me was Henry Blodge in his early days. So he was going around screaming and yelling that uh, dynastic levels of wealth are going to be created. He was 100% right. But those were companies in their infancy. This is a different ballgame. These are massive, massive profitable companies that are doing this. To the extent you're willing to talk any names, you may not be. Are there any in general that pique your interest as you're talking about this space? The way I think about it is that in bad times, people focus on the quality of balance sheets and credit quality. And in good times, they focus on stories. And we're in story time right now. To me, there are two great equity stories and a third non-equity story. And those are AI and everything having to do with it, which is a lot of tentacles, and infrastructure. Those are the two great equity stories of our time. And the third great story is Bitcoin, which I don't believe in. So I don't participate. And how long, I'm not sure I'm not involved. How do you put your finger on the pulse of this when the narrative has shifted from story time to, oh, wait, balance sheets matter, whatever it may be? Is it sort of just a subjective vibe feeling? Do you got a secret indicator we don't know about? Look, never forget, two thirds of the U.S. economy is related to consumer. So if you could construct a case that would show the U.S. consumer was about to fall apart, that would be a real recession. It wouldn't be a recession like the great financial crisis because we don't have any of those sort of balance sheet problems in the banks, but you'd have a recession. I just don't see any data that points to that. I see data that points to some slowing, but I don't see anything more than that. All right. Well, full steam ahead. You mentioned infrastructure. 
Does that mean toll roads? Does that mean specific to? Oh, it's a lot broader than that. It's a combination of there are four mega themes, and then there's a political sort of overlay. So the four mega themes are, in no particular order, onshoring, data centers, improvement of the electrical grid, and greenification. And then you've got an industrial policy created by the Biden administration from the IRA to the IIJA to the CHIPS Act that kind of supercharge all four themes. That's been kind of the infrastructure story for the last couple of years. And that may change if we have a Trump administration. Not that the overarching infrastructure story will change, but some parts of it will be de-emphasized and some parts will be emphasized more. Like, for example, onshoring has been a big deal for years now. But if Trump's president, that's going to even go faster. And so as we take it to the next extension, who's going to be the main beneficiary? We talk about onshoring. Well, the onshoring beneficiaries are mostly industrial companies. This whole infrastructure story from an investment perspective is a non-tech story. So don't think about tech companies. They're, I mean, are they involved tangentially? This is all non-tech. So if you want to break it up by subsector, it would be, number one, companies in the what's called the construction and design sector, like uh, Quanta, for example, to industrial companies, and that would be divided up into three groups. That would be electrification, automation, and then there's a shot here that the gas turbine business is going to take off. And you'd have the materials area, like a bulk of materials, because somebody's got to build, do the roads, the bridges, et cetera. There's a whole greenification part to this, which it's unclear how that's going to fare in the next administration, but there's solar, hydrogen, et cetera. Then there's some utilities. And then there's water, companies that make basically pipes for more new water. And it's about, you know, if you wanted to say, like, how many companies out there is it really relevant to? It's about 80 companies. Now, you wouldn't invest in all 80, obviously, but that would be the universe that you would say this is where it's really relevant. I don't know. We can get a Steve Eisman ETF and then just buy all 80. I would put 80 companies in the ETF. I'd put maybe 30. Well, it's interesting because you're talking about a couple sectors that I think most investors, when they hear some of the themes, they'd be like, oh, materials even utilities for some of these, perhaps, is an interesting basket that probably energy, maybe even, that most people may not suspect. Under this administration, traditional energy has been radically de-emphasized. So if you were investing in the energy sector in the last several years, I'm guessing you'd never make much money. Exceptions, obviously. Solar stocks are like the most volatile stocks like on planet Earth. You need... Uh, a stomach of steel to be able to withstand how much those stocks go up and down every day. But under the current political, under the IRA and IIJA, there's a lot of money being thrown at what's called renewables by the government, which is why, let's say, a company like an Xterra, which is the biggest market cap utility in the country, has about 45% of its revenue coming from renewable projects. What's going to happen in a Trump administration? I mean, it's hard to say because a lot will depend upon whether both houses of Congress go Republican or not. Both houses of Republican go, you'll probably see some changes to the IRA, which would be hurtful to renewables and helpful to traditional energy. On the other hand, if both houses of Congress don't flip, it'll be more of a regulatory story. The devil will be in the details. So right now, the whole energy structure in terms of investing is very difficult because it's so dependent upon politics right now. I mean, I have a political prediction of who I think is going to be president, but you know, I could be wrong. It's funny because I've talked over the years about politics a little bit in terms of I'm a quant, so rules based, but curiosity. And I like always teasing out some ideas. And historically speaking, one of the best indicators of who's going to win the election is what is the stock market doing running up into the election? And so incumbent party stays in power. This year feels like it's going to be a little different because of all the things we've had in the past couple of weeks. If you look at the prediction markets, assuming we currently have, by the time this publishes, who knows, the Democratic nominee being the current vice president, TBD, it's about a 60-40 Trump, a Republican-Democrat chance of the presidency. But 
who knows. You're not shy to tweet about these things. Your second most popular tweet ever, by the way, was... By the way, I'm such a Luddite, I wouldn't even know how to figure that out. (laughs) But I don't know, what is my second most popular tweet? Well, it was in the last week, and it was really thoughtful. You were talking about last night's speech was revealing about the current differences between Republicans and Democrats, culmination of changes in the past 20 years, talking about populism, talking about a moral, a moral, very thoughtful post. We'll put it in the show note links, listeners. You're welcome to summarize it if you remember it, but it's a week ago, so maybe not. No, I could summarize it. I mean, basically, the concept is that in some ways, the Republican and Democratic parties have flipped. Think about just what policies you're talking about. I'm talking about like, who's a Republican, who's a Democrat? So, you know, if we were talking 20 years ago, 30 years ago, Democratic Party was the party of unions. And gradually, they've moved completely away from that. And they've become, I mean, I'm, I'm going to make it a pejorative way of say, saying it, but the educated class in Silicon Valley. And the Republican Party, which used to be the party of the rich, is now the party, is now the populist party. And it's totally flipped. And the speech that J.D. Vance gave is very illuminating in that respect. We were supposed to have J.D. Vance on the podcast back in 2021. And it slipped through the cracks, but this was related to him being a a venture capitalist and author unrelated to his current. The day after his speech, my wife and I rewatched Hillbilly Elegy movie. Is it good? I haven't seen it. Very good movie. But I think to me, the most from a political sort of analysis, most important sort of parts of the movie are, are just the parts where they're driving through areas where they live, Kentucky, Ohio, and and, they're going through towns and like half the towns are boarded up. The stores are gone. The factories are gone. People were always shocked that President Trump got elected the first time and who voted for him. And my attitude was that part of America has been ignored for the last 30 years. And Trump showed up and said, hey, I'm for you. And all these people said, listen, (laughs) nobody's been for us for 30 years. Some guy shows up and says he's for us. We'll try. I think that's one of the major reasons why he got elected, and it's probably why he'll get elected again. And so you talk about a few other things. You talk about tariffs, policy. As an investor, I don't feel like there's that major of policy impacts, but this certain go-round, it definitely feels to me like a pretty widespread between potential outcomes and how it might change markets. Oh, absolutely. Like you said, there's tariffs, taxes, regulation. Again, never forget, you need 60 votes in the Senate to do anything. So unless Trump takes both houses, look, if he gets 55 seats in the Senate, I have no idea if that's even possible. That'd go a long way for him to be able to do whatever he wants. Other than that, it's going to be a regulatory game, which, don't get me wrong, the regulatory game is very, very powerful. But combine that with changing legislation and you've got real power. So as an odds person, Trump's currently favored 60%, assuming I'd say it's that 100%. My 100%. 100%. Well, you also have a lead in to the, you think the DNC is going to be a bit of a mess. I mean, it's already a mess, but the actual convention come August. So it's funny. The prediction that I made on TV like two months ago where I said Trump would win 100% and they all yelled at me was based on the fact it hasn't happened yet. My prediction was essentially that in August at the Democratic convention, all the protesters from all the universities were going to go to the convention and they would burn American flags, they'd burn Israeli flags, and they would spew whatever they spew and the whole country would watch. It'd be like 68 Chicago again, although this time it's going to be 2024 Chicago. And Trump wins. And that was simply my prediction. So since then, obviously, we had the debate. So that increased the odds beyond 100%. And now we have a new presidential candidate from the Democratic side. Right now, uh, Vice President Harris is kind of in like, a, I guess you could call a honeymoon period. This is not a criticism of anybody. I don't think anybody really wants Kamala Harris to be president of the United States. I mean, she hasn't gone through a process. Nobody voted for her. Think about how bizarre this is. You, know, you have president of the United States who announced on Twitter that he's not running. And he anoints... We don't do that in America. We don't anoint anybody. He just anointed his vice president as as the candidate. And everybody told the line, and she's going to be the Democratic candidate, and nobody's voted for her. What do they say? Her support is a mile wide and a centimeter thick. That isn't to say she can't win. I just think the odds are very heavily weighted against her. We've been talking, again, this isn't really for me being a political comment, but I like 
prediction markets. And from the odds person in me, we're talking about it and was talking on Twitter for really a long time. For the majority of this year, I said, it seems like a good wager to be betting on the field against Biden for the nomination, which is well-regarded common knowledge today, to use a phrase from Ben Hunt, as he is not up to the task. My favorite stat of all this was that Bill Clinton, who was our president over 30 years ago, is younger than both Trump and Biden today, (laughs) which is an astonishing statistic. The last election had an element of this, but this one is becoming much more widespread with Vegas and the prediction markets. It's interesting to follow this in real time. And I wonder how much that's actually informed some of the decisions where people were looking at the prediction markets and saying, Biden, actually, you're a 10 to 1 underdog. You have to. You have to walk away. I don't know. I have no idea. So presumably, if things continue the way they are and there's a Trump presidency, are there any tilts, ideas that we should be thinking about as far as markets that you think might be worth considering? I don't think it impacts tech one way or the other. People are going to buy NVIDIA chips because they got to do AI and Apple will do their upgrade cycle. It doesn't matter who's president. That part of the story is going to be the same. And it's going to depend upon how rapidly people come up with apps that people want to use. Yay. I mean, this whatever you thought about it before, you should think about it going forward. It's, it's unchanged. The infrastructure story, like I said, could change. I mean, would I invest in solar stocks right now, given the political uncertainty? I wouldn't. I mean, I'll give you an example of one stock. I have no position in this stock, okay? I think it's a well-run company. It's a company called First Solar. So First Solar is the largest producer of solar panels in the United States. When you buy a First Solar panel, it costs about 25% more to buy a First Solar panel than it does to buy a panel from China if there were no tariffs. This gets to complexity. When President Trump was president, he created the solar tariffs that equalized the field. Then President Biden comes in with the IRA and creates all these tax incentives and tax deals to get people to buy more solar panels. So for solar, they broke even in 2022. They made $7.74 in 2023. The estimate for 2024 is almost $14. And for 2025, it's $22. Now, a lot of that is because of tax incentives, because they also get tax breaks for producing the solar panels in the United States. So you have a combination of tariffs, which I don't think are going to go away, but you also have all these tax things that explode their earnings, both from a demand perspective and just from a math perspective in that their taxes are less. Let's say Harris wins. This shot stock's probably a moonshot because everything that you know is going to stay the same. So the estimates are the same. The stock is selling at 10 times 2025. And if Harris wins, all all this stuff is going to last many more years. So you would buy first solar. Like I said, I have no position in this stock. On the other hand, if Trump wins and let's say both houses of Congress go Republican, you'll hear noises that they want to change the IRA. And maybe they do stuff. I don't know what. Maybe they eliminate or reduce, you know, whatever, some of these tax incentives. So instead of making $22 in 2025, they make less. How much? I don't know. It's impossible to say. But this is like existential in a way, this issue for this company. So would I buy First Solar today, given the uncertainty? I wouldn't. Somebody else might. But it's too crazy. It goes in the too hard pile, for sure. Too hard to, to handicap. You briefly mentioned crypto, but then you don't like it or don't have any exposure. What's kind of your mental approach to that? So I'm going to go back to offend probably half your viewers, but that's okay. So my attitude towards crypto is, there are two issues with crypto. Number one, is it a currency? And number two, if it's a currency, why should I own it? So the issue of, is it a currency? At this point, I've come to, that's like a pointless discussion. Some people think it is, some people think it's not. There's no data point that anybody can point to that could prove that it is, and can prove that it's not. So let's skip it. Let's assume it's a currency. So the real issue is, okay, It's a currency, but there are a lot of currencies in this world. Why should I own crypto? That's the big philosophical question. And I think if you ask the crypto people, most of them would say roughly the same thing, which is that there's been a debasement of fiat currency for years. 
And then, you know, people go into all the ways via currents, too much money has been produced, et cetera, et cetera. And you can't short the dollar because the dollar trades relative to all of the currencies and the dollar is a global reserve currency. So you're not going to buy the yen as a hedge against the dollar. That's pointless. So as your hedge against the dollar, buy crypto. And that's the thesis. And sounds great. And then here's my question to the crypto people, which is, if that's the case, if that's your thesis, then on days where NVIDIA is up ridiculous amounts and interest rates are low and people are feeling great, crypto should go down. And on days where, like today, NVIDIA is down 5% and interest rates are up at the same time because somebody thought, oh, if Trump becomes president, it's going to become inflationary and you're worried about inflation, blah, 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 crypto should be up. And that's not how it acts. Crypto has like a 70% correlation to NASDAQ. So there's theory and there's practice. And practice, what it is to me, is another way for people to speculate about speculating. And by the way, this is like a religion in the sense that there's no data point that you could point to that says you're right or you're wrong. So for example, when I was short subprime paper, every month, the entire securitization market would report every single credit data point on every single securitization known to mankind. It's like the biggest data dump every month imaginable. That world stopped for two days a month on the two days that that, in the middle of the month when that data would come out, everybody would study it like it was the Torah. God's word had come down. And then everybody would draw whatever conclusions they wanted, whether they were right, they were wrong, but it was data every month that would tell you, am am, am I right or am I wrong? There's no data that tells you whether crypto should be worth more or should be worth less. People speculate about it. So I don't call that investing. It's it's just speculating to me. So I don't know what to do about that. There's no thesis to have to be long it, and there's no thesis to have to be short it. It just is. So that's why I don't play. I like it. It just is. You have a great quote. I think this is you. So when you're talking about financial innovation, and so you say very rare is there's something that's actually innovation. It's a euphemism for hiding leverage, which I thought was great. But let's say the next president, whomever it may be, listens to the Meb Faber show and they say, you know, I really like this guy. I'm here for some recommendations. Financial system, it could be investing, it could be anything policy related in this finance investing world. You got any good ideas for us to implement? What should we be doing? To me, the big issues are, number one, we are too dependent right now on chips being made in Taiwan. I think that's a national security issue. Now, Factories are being built here. That's why I was part of the CHIPS Act. But I think that that should be one of the major priorities of, of any administration. One of the nice things about Nuremberg is we have an entire research department that everybody gets to use. And we have a wonderful chip app, semiconductor analysts. One of the things I love to do every month is walk into our office and say, and say to her, hey, what happens if China invades Taiwan? Because at which point her hair literally stands on end and she starts talking about the literally the end of the world every time. But she's not wrong. That's a risk that we can't take. The other thing that I would focus on is that for 20 years, electrical consumption in the United States did not grow. And now it's growing about two and a half percent per year. That's a combination of more EVs, data centers, et cetera. So there are 4,000 currently U.S. electrical grid produces about 4,000 terawatt hours of electricity. If that data is correct, we need to get to 5,000 in 10 years. If we're going to be able to power all the data centers, et cetera, that's stuff that we want to do. And we're still retiring coal, which probably means that instead of building 1,000 more terawatts of hours, we probably need to build almost 1,500 terawatt more hours in 10 years. That's a lot of terawatt hours, and we are not going to get there with renewables. It's just physically impossible. So I think the only way to get there is with gas, and that has to be factored into any administration, no matter how environmentally conscious they are. Well, good news is we got a lot of gas somewhere here in the U.S. Oh, it's there, but then you got to build gas turbines in utilities, not just to have enough to have gas. You got to build the turbine to make the electricity from the gas. 
this is kind of a layup question for you, but it may not be what we think it is. So feel free to answer this any way you want. But we ask the guests, what's been your most memorable investment? It doesn't have to be good. It could be bad. It could be something in between. But the one that's most memorable, what you got for us? From a more recent vintage would have been Quanta, which is the company that got gets hired by utilities basically to build renewable plants. That's part of the story. The best kind of long investments to me are companies that haven't grown very much for a long time and something secular has changed and they're about to grow a lot. The multiple doesn't reflect that at all. So if you can find those kind of inflection points, that's where you make a lot of money because not only do the earnings estimates start to go up, but the multiple starts to go up. NVIDIA, by the way, is the opposite. NVIDIA's earnings went up so much, the multiple went down. But if you can find situations where companies are at inflection points, so that not only are the earnings estimates going to go higher, but the multiple's going to go higher, you get a double whammy. Yeah, uh, you got to know a little more than the market. That's for sure. That'll get you there. Steve, this has been a blast. We're bumping up against squash time. If people want to read or musings, what you're up to, obviously they can find you on Twitter. I'm not shy there. Anywhere else to find what you're thinking about markets and what's going on in your world? The only thing that I comment is on Twitter. That's it. And that's actually pretty new for me. I have been doing it for less than a year. Well, you're a natural, if anything. Listeners, Steve, this has been a blast. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Podcast listeners will post show notes to today's conversation at mebfaber.com forward slash podcast. If you love the show, if you hate it, shoot us feedback at the mebfabershow.com. We love to read the reviews. Please review us on iTunes and subscribe to the show anywhere good podcasts are found. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. Good investing.